Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Cody Eckert. I'm the Director of Global Operations for MUN Impact. Thank you so much for joining us from all corners of the, the world. Um, today, we are delighted to host Ms. Sophia Chiani. And um, I apologize, we had a last minute uh, shake up with our, our admin staff, but um, Ms. Ms. Chiani, um, or admin stuff, do we have any uh, last minute announcements before we begin? It appears not. So without much further ado, Ms. Chiani, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Of course. Hi, everyone. My name is Sophia Chiani, and I'm a youth climate activist. Um, and so I'll share my screen with you all so that I can show you my presentation. Um, let me just switch my tabs. So I'll first start with how I became passionate about the climate movement, why I really started to get involved. Um, and so to begin, I'll share with you guys some photos of me at different climate events. So this is me. Uh, on the left, you can see that's a picture of me at the Black Friday climate strike. Um, and so I was striking alongside Jane Fonda and some other amazing youth climate activists. On the right, you can see that's a photo of me uh, right before my hunger strike uh, in Nancy Pelosi's office uh, with my Fridays for Future sign. And then at the bottom left, you can see that's a photo of me giving my speech to the press um, right before my hunger strike. And so to continue, here are some other photos of me with some amazing activists. And I always think it's really important to highlight that um, the youth climate movement is not defined by one singular person or even a group of people. It really is a collective movement um, working towards solving the climate crisis. So I always think it's very important to acknowledge those people who are working with me. Um, and so on the left, that might be a familiar face to some of you. That's me with Jane Fonda. Um, and on the right, at the top, that's a photo of me uh, at a meeting with Jane Fonda and with some awesome youth climate activists from New York City. And on the bottom right, that's a photo of me striking again at the funeral for a future Black Friday strike. Um, and so how did I get to this point where I was engaging in climate strikes, helping to organize climate events, etc. cetera? Um, and so it really started for me during middle school, uh, which is when I took a trip to Iran, which is my parents' home country. And so while I was in Iran, I realized that there was really a severe pollution problem that was turning into a major public health crisis and there was also a climate crisis happening. Um, and so you can see this uh, news article really like shows how bad the pollution in Iran was. And in fact, it was so bad for me that I couldn't even see the stars at night, which I thought was horrifying. Um, and so these are some other photos that really demonstrate how terrible Iran's pollution is. And this, these are all recent. So uh, really the pollution has gotten worse in recent years since I last visited in middle school. Um, and so for me, the thing wasn't only just that the pollution was horrible. It was that my relatives were really also unaware of the impact that they themselves were having on the climate crisis and on exacerbating the environmental disaster in Iran. Um, and so you can see heavy pollution in Iran hospitalizes 1,500 people in 24 hours. Uh, babies are dying of air pollution. So really nothing has gotten better. Um, and in fact, in the Middle East, temperatures are actually rising more than twice the global average. So it's not just exclusive to Iran. There really is a general Middle Eastern climate crisis happening. And I thought it was really important for people like my relatives to be informed um, about what was happening. Um, and so about a year ago is when I realized that there was a lot of other passionate youth climate activists um, in a variety of different organizations who are really working on playing their part in solving the climate crisis and organizing amazing climate strikes and different events. Um, and so that is when I reached out to many of them. I, I sent probably like 100 emails saying that I really wanted to get involved and I asked how I could help and I talked about my story um, why I was so passionate about the climate crisis and talked about the work that I had been doing to educate my relatives in Iran. Um, and so on the left, you will see that is the symbol for this is Zero Hour. So I work on their national partnerships team. Um, and really what makes Zero Hour special is that we are primarily led by women of color. Um, and really what we focus on doing is um, 
we want to make sure that youth uh, and people of color and women are really on the front lines of the climate movement and we organize different workshops um, lobbying sessions and there's a lot that we do and uh, on the partnerships team i'm right now working on our uh, national push to get out um, the vote uh, especially for uh, climate friendly candidates um, and in the middle, you can see that's the logo for Fridays for Future USA. I have worked primarily as like a national strategist for them, working with press releases, et cetera. Um, and so what makes Fridays for Future different is that we were founded by Greta Thunberg. And so we have been striking every single Friday. Right now we've actually uh, transitioned into a digital strike, which I can talk a little more uh, about later. And so obviously because of COVID. And so yeah, what makes Fridays for Future different is that we are a movement. So anyone around the world can participate and you just strike every Friday during your school, during your lunch break, whenever you can, uh, holding up a Fridays for Future sign or a different theme. Um, and so on the right, you can see that's the logo for Extinction Rebellion. So I first got involved with Extinction Rebellion um, when I went on my hunger strike, um, I believe in November. And so what makes Extinction Rebellion different is that we really focus on nonviolent civil disobedience. So you might have seen Extinction Rebellion in the news um, for we've had a bunch of really big actions, such as in uh, Times Square, they brought a giant tank and spray painted it like yellow and with the XR symbol. Uh, and so they really focus on gaining publicity through these stunts and by uh, we want to aim to mobilize approximately 2.5% of the population to engage in civil disobedience with us in order to really have an impact um, and to raise awareness so that our government acts on the climate crisis. And so I've been working uh, oh. with media and strategy and messaging with them. Um, and I also have acted as an international spokesperson. Want to add something? May I? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Um... So what if uh, during these rebellions, we are like by politics action, like I'm in India and during rebellions and during protest demonstrations, we are often arrested by the police over here. So uh, doesn't that kind of strike a fear in the mind of people who are um, doing these demonstrations and like uh, prevent them from doing further doing so? Here, basically, like, uh, school students like me, teenagers, they're, we are very restricted. I mean, we are restricted by our parents and we are restricted by our, um, by certain rules that we are like, we're not allowed to, you know, uh, participate in. Uh, I think that questions are supposed to be saved until the end. So I'll just, uh, you can ask your question at the end because I will probably be addressing that. Um, and so to continue from where I left off, um, so I have been working with those three environmental movements for the past year. And so about a month ago is when I finally founded my own nonprofit, which is Climate Cardinals. And so we are an international nonprofit that is working to make the climate um, movement more accessible to those who don't speak English. Um, and so we are translating climate change information into a growing array of languages through our vast network of student translators. Um, and so volunteers can work from home and earn community service hours from the comfort of their house. Um, and so because of that, our growth has continued to accelerate even during the era of social distancing. Um, and so really my inspiration for Climate Cardinals came from the fact that I knew that my relatives in Iran did not know much about the climate crisis when I went in middle school. Um, and so I thought this was a huge problem. And I, I realized that a part of the reason why is because most um, climate research and information is available only in English. And so I thought that this was a huge problem. And so I was translating um, climate information into Farsi to educate my relatives. Um, and so I realized that if I mobilized other students to do the same thing, um, to translate climate information into other languages so that they could educate their relatives, then we really could have a global movement of people working together to um, translate and educate people around the world. Um, and so in terms of how Climate Cardinals has grown, so like I said, this has really been an idea that I've had ever since middle school, but it wasn't until probably like a few months ago that I realized that it was something I really wanted to 
turn into like a big idea and into an organization. And so while I was working within those other nonprofit organizations, um, I realized that there really was an opportunity for me to use my skills and expertise and the people that I had met and translate it into my own organization. And so we did launch about over a month ago. Um, and so we have now grown. We actually, these statistics are a little out of date. So we actually have now over 15 directors. We have all, over 700 expert language leads. Um, we have almost 5,500 student volunteers and the average age is around 15 or 16. Um, and so our impact, we're currently working on translating 3,000 pages of climate information. Um, and we have people signed up to translate in over 100 languages. Um, and so we really started off with a bang. We were featured on the front page of the Washington Post, MTV, Business Insider, a bunch of other really major news outlets. Um, and why I mentioned this is because part of starting your own nonprofit is you really have to take into account, oops, uh, you really have to take into account press strategy, partnerships, um, really leveraging any sort of connection you can have. Um, because by utilizing these connections, I was really able to get Climate Cardinals in, in front of a wide audience, which is why in such a short period of time, we have been able to get so many um, volunteers. And so that's definitely something I would advise to anyone who's interested in starting your own nonprofit. Definitely work on press strategy, outreach strategy, build up a network of partners who are ready to support you from the get-go. Um, and also, of course, to reach out to your friends and family and anyone who can really be involved in the initial launch. And so in terms of our partnerships or um, organizations that we're collaborating with or going to collaborate with, um, so start with Future Coalition, um, really in terms of like the logistic goals, like steps of starting a nonprofit. Um, so you need 501c3 status, which is like just a legal status in order to be able to give out community service hours, which is like the reason how our the like it's the way that our organization thrives. Um, it's that we give students community service hours for translating climate information and then they get community service hours so it's like a mutual exchange. Um, so we worked with Future Coalition to uh, secure a fiscal sponsor so that we were able to give out community service hours. Um, and then in terms of with Wikipedia, we're going to be forming a partnership to translate their um, climate information articles uh, with Columbia University. We're going to be working on reaching out to local New York teachers um, and school systems so that they can be um, implementing our translating program, uh, our teacher program, which really the way it works is like teachers, uh, language teachers give out climate change assignments and then we publish them on our websites, the work that the teachers do. Um, and then Respond Crisis Translation Network. Um, so we are working with them. They have professional translators, so they help to proofread our final translations. Like right now, um, those 3,000 3, pages of climate information that we have translated, um, Respond Crisis Translation is going to be working to proofread just so that um, obviously when, when the work is being done by student translators, it's not perfect. Um, and so they help give us like that little extra stamp of legitimacy. Um, and so more, more moving on to like the climate movement as a whole. And also I know I'm going to save questions for the end, but I did see a few questions about joining. Um, and so I'll, I'll just touch on that a little bit in terms of climate cardinals. We really are open to anyone to join as long as you are bilingual, you can uh, read and write two languages. And we actually just opened up another team application. So we realized that some people um, are not bilingual. Obviously not everyone is bilingual. Um, and so we also have the opportunity for people to um, earn community service hours by helping to source research that we want to translate. We have a graphic design team. Uh, we have a video producing team. We have a partnerships team. We have a lot of different teams. And so we really have built out to become a full fledged organization. Um, we're going to be transitioning into voting. Um, content we're going to be transitioning into like primarily sourcing information rather than only translating so there definitely is a lot of um room for us to grow and anyone who's interested can go to climatecardinals.org um, and i would definitely encourage you to sign up for our new team member applications um, because that's primarily going to be what we're recruiting right now um, and so I can answer any other questions pertaining to Climate Cardinals more towards the end in terms of like how to sign up, blah, blah, blah. And I can like drop a link in the chat. Um, and so more generally, uh, 
talking about the youth climate movement. Um, I thought this was a really great explanation by Zero Hour. And so really what it's talking about is as a movement, we believe that those are who on the front lines of any movement should lead that movement. Um, and so part of what this means is that, um, like I was saying before, climate change disproportionately affects people of color. And so because of that, we believe that um, people of color should be on the front lines of the, of the climate movement. And same thing with youth, like youth are going to be disproportionately affected by the climate crisis during their lifetime. Um, and so we should be on the front lines. And then obviously we believe that youth leadership is transformational and visionary. Um, and so youth are more progressive. We have more aggressive demands on the climate crisis. Um, we really want widespread systematic change in a way that many adults do not. Um, and additionally, we also believe that of course we will be peaceful and nonviolent. So I know um, that one of the questions that was really being asked earlier was um, like in terms of getting arrested or participating in a protest. So speaking on behalf of like XR, I mean, I, um, I have never gotten arrested and I have never been comfortable been getting arrested, especially because of my parents, um, because that's something that they're not comfortable with. Um, and so I always express that very clearly. And that's something that um, nobody has ever had an issue with. They always like very clearly before an action, they state whether or not you are willing to go through the risk of getting arrested. If you are not, then there are certain procedures that you have to take. And then if you are willing to get ar arrested, then there are also like different procedures that you're going to take. Um, and so it's very much about, um, we call it like very much like harnessing your privilege. So like, for example, Jane Fonda can get arrested like as many times as she wants. And that's not going to have uh, a bad impact on her career because she's already such an established like public figure and celebrity. But if I were to get arrested, you know, like as an incoming like college freshman, as a student, um, as someone who's not in as much as a position of power, it could have very negative effects on my future. So like I said, it's very much about harnessing your position of privilege. So while it might not be a good choice for me or for other students, um, for other people, it's perfectly fine for them to get arrested and they're able to raise a lot of awareness and publicity um, by doing so. And so we will extend the hand of friendship. And what I mean by this is like, but too often I hear this dialogue that's like us versus them, like adults versus youth, but really that's not what we're going for at all. In fact, we really love to work with adults and we know that there's a lot that we can do uh, with them and a lot that we can like learn from. Um, and so we always do extend the hand of friendship and we demand that our allies take action in solidarity with us so that they're not co-opting our movement, but rather helping to support us. Um, and so, of course, we affirm climate change is real, indigenous rights must be honored, generations must learn from an, each other, and we are an ex inclusive movement. Um, and so what we mean by this, by all of this, is that, of course, climate change is real. And so we really try to ground everything that we're doing in science. We always want to reference statistics. Um, we really also want to give the spotlight to scientists. Um, and so while I, of course, have like recommendations that I think that we should be doing and I have certain opinions, I would never, um, I would never assert myself as the foremost expert on the topic. And I always do think we should defer to scientists when making specific policy recommendations. Um, and then indigenous rights being honored. Um, indigenous people have been uh, really fighting for this planet for decades, long before I and many other climate activists have been, which is why it's really important to include them in conversations and really um, make sure that their, their voices are heard and that their perspective is shared with the world. Um, and so this is a graph that really just um, shows that in the United States and other wealthy countries, like they are the top um, emission polluters, like you can see the CO2 per person is much higher in the United States. And so this is just really demonstrating what I think is important, which is that um, it's important for countries like the United States to take responsibility and realize that like since we are such a big polluter, uh, the onus really is on us to play a huge part in solving the climate crisis, because without us in the equation, um, then everyone else's efforts will be in vain because you can't just have this one weak leg that isn't doing anything or else we can't solve the crisis. 
Um, and so now we're going to talk about an issue that I think is really neglected in the climate movement, which is environmental racism. Um, and so really what this means is that when industrial fossil fuel projects are, con are constructed in majority minority neighborhoods, and so that's negatively impacting the well-being of people of color. And so this is a short video that I think does a really great job of explaining. It's only human to find um, So I just need to wait for this ad to pass. Our search to transform um, farm waste and so while this is playing, I guess I'll just say that um, I think this is definitely something that needs to be addressed more and that people need to talk about more because it is a huge component of the climate crisis. In America, air and water are separate but unequal. Environmental racism is the new Jim Crow. Yeah, yeah, I get it. The environment isn't a person. How can it be racist? But the most basic pieces of the environment, the air we breathe and the water we drink, are controlled and designed by people. And people can be racist. More than half of all people who live close to hazardous waste are people of color. Floodplains nationwide have high populations of Blacks and Hispanics. Black children are twice as likely to suffer from lead poisoning as white children. This inequality is no accident. Pollution and the risk of disaster are a sign to black and brown communities through generations of discrimination and political neglect. Enslaved Africans were commodities partly because their work carried environmental risks that were unacceptable to whites, like exposure to heat, malaria, and mosquitoes. As Jim Crow laws created racial segregation, they also reinforced an environmental system that still disadvantages minorities. It's no wonder that black and Hispanic children have the highest rates of asthma, or that hurricanes like Katrina, Sandy, and Matthew did their worst damage in communities of color. Rich white neighborhoods can update their water pipes, but not places like Flint. The Jim Crow laws are dead and gone, but the fact that people of color are still more likely to die from environmental causes is no accident. Um, and so now moving forward to, um, and so the reason why, again, that I bring that up is because of my point where um, the climate crisis really is disproportionately affecting people of color, which is why it's really important to um, include black and brown people in the climate conversation and make sure that their voices are prioritized because they really are the ones who have had firsthand experience with the climate crisis and its disastrous ramifications. Um, and so again, moving forward on what has the youth climate movement accomplished. So I really would say that our signature accomplishment um, was the September 20th strike um, when we had over 7.5 million people turn out from across the world to strike with us. Um, so this really was our signature accomplishment. Many of you guys might have seen this was when Greta really was blowing up and she really helped to lead the movement and to lead the climate strike. Um, and so we were planning a similar action on Earth Day, but unfortunately because of COVID, a lot of stuff has changed. Um, and so on the left, you can see that's like the Youth Climate Coalition. Um, so that's just some of the organizations and um, nonprofits that have banded together to help, saw, uh, to help fight the climate crisis and to organize these climate strikes and marches. Um, and then in terms of the, the COVID pivot, um, on the right, you can see that's FFF Digital. So that's an example of how we have adapted to the coronavirus. Um, and so instead of striking every single Friday outside, um, we have started to digitally strike every Friday and it's really easy to join. Anyone can just go to the FFF Digital Instagram and DM them a picture of them striking um, and they'll include it in their weekly collage. Um, and so I think that's really awesome because obviously it's a very easy way for people to get involved and you're still like raising awareness during these hard times. Um, and then moving on to structural changes. So like I said, this is not an exhaustive list and this is more um, a recommendation. Of course, we need to defer to scientists when making like concrete policy proposals, but this is stuff that people themselves can also do. So local schools should be implementing climate justice education, which includes how the climate part, uh, crisis is disproportionately affecting people of color. Um, we need to be implementing local community farming because agriculture is a huge uh, component of the climate crisis. We need to be urging local elected officials to be creating affordable mass transit systems um, because also like the use of cars can is also contributing to the climate crisis. Um, and then we need to just transition away from fossil fuels um, to sustainable energy sources. And so a just transition like is included in the Green New Deal. And really what it means is that you're taking into account um, the, the needs of fossil fuel employees because obviously 
You can't just like leave these people leave these people unemployed. Um, you can't just be um, just be taking their jobs away and not really offering up an, an alternative. So uh, a just transition would be allowing funding to go towards retraining them and giving them new job opportunities in a renewable energy field. Um, and so we need to demand that those in power get to the roots of the climate crisis and tackle the systems of oppression that caused it in the first place. Um, and so for too long, businesses have been prioritizing, um, oops, I, I switched that, but profit over planet. So it needs to be planet over profit, obviously, always. Um, and so we really need to make sure that new regulations that we are implementing um, reflect the realities of our current situation and really acknowledge that we need to be prioritizing our planet and not just letting companies to um, needlessly pollute. Um, and so what can you specifically do? These are just some recommendations. So you can get your school board to pass a climate resolution. Um, really what this would entail is a lot of different things. They could be pledging to divest from fossil fuels. Um, they could be pledging to implement climate justice education, et cetera. You can divest your money or you can tell your parents to divest their money from national banks to credit unions. Um, you can do your best to support businesses that have divested from fossil fuels because it's very hard, it's costly. Um, they really are making a big sacrifice when they are doing something like that. Um, and so it's always great to support sustainable, eco-conscious businesses. Um, and then you can support local elected officials who believe in climate justice um, and also urge your local officials to take the no fossil fuel money pledge. Um, really, like that's basically exactly what it sounds like. They're basically saying that they're not going to be um, taking money from polluters, you know, like uh, from big oil companies, from people who are lobbying. Um, and that really just maintains their integrity and it shows that they're not just going to um, vote against climate uh, legislation because they're being unduly influenced by uh, money. Um, and then educate yourself and others. Again, pretty intuitive. Make sure that you're read up on like important pieces of climate legislation or that you just have basic climate uh, knowledge because if you're trying to educate your relative or someone close to you about the climate crisis, if you don't know specific statistics, if you don't know numbers, if you don't have examples, um, it will be a lot harder to convince them that your point is legitimate. Um, and then start or join a local climate organization. So Fridays for Future, Extinction Rebellion, Zero Hour, they all have chapters around the world. It's very easy to join. Um, and then of course, in terms of climate cardinals, um, it's very easy to join. You just have to go to our website um, and you can uh, apply to join one of our teams or you can apply to become a translator. And like I said before, um, I would 100% uh, urge everyone to go try and sign up to be uh, a team member because you don't have to be bilingual and we just reopened the applications due to popular demand. So they're back. It's really easy to earn service hours and you're also doing a great service um, to the planet because you're helping to educate people from around the world um, about climate change in different languages. Um, and so that was a pretty exhaustive look at everything I've been doing, what you guys can do. Um, and so now I would love to answer any questions you guys might have for me, um, especially I can either go through the chat or I can open it up for people to ask me orally. Um, and so, yeah, I would love to share my advice with you all. And so let me know what you would like to know more about. And thank you for coming to my presentation. So we have a question from Arena from Canada. So can you please open your mic and ask your question, Arena? Yeah, of course. So I first want to just start off by saying thank you for presenting. It was a really great presentation and I learned a lot. And I know I had a, a few questions, so I'm going to answer one of my more pressing questions. Um, so I have a relative and uncle who doesn't believe in climate change. And um, there's been multiple fights with like between families because he will not listen to statistics. So I was wondering if you had any uh, insight on what I should do for that. So to be completely honest, I do not recommend using your time and energy to convince people who do not believe in climate change that it is real. And the reason I say this is because there are so many people who believe in climate change, but who just don't think that it's a big issue. So if you're focusing on those people when you're telling them, hey, like, I know you believe in climate, in the climate crisis, but you really need to, like, 
you need to act on that. You need to, you can't just be giving it lip service. If you care about this issue, then you would be voting for climate friendly candidates. You would be joining your local climate organization, like, et cetera. You would be taking these steps and it, like, you can have a lot bigger impact by focusing on people like that rather than just focusing on people who are never going to believe in cli the climate change no matter what you say because like they really have been brainwashed or they just lack the education um and so of course like i mean i wouldn't i wouldn't tell you like not to try at all to convince your uncle like definitely you should try um but i i would say i think your efforts are better um placed in a way where you're you're convincing people who do believe in the climate crisis to join a climate organization to donate etc Thank you, that makes sense. Thanks. So the next question is from Lisa F. from Qatar. Can you just... Uh, hi. Um, yeah. Hi, sorry. Just scrolling back to my question. I wanted to ask about... So you've mentioned a few ways where we can make personal changes to get involved. And you've also highlighted a few of the aspects on what, what skills we should be honing. But if you can elaborate a bit more on that, so how can we get more involved? Do we need to develop our marketing skills or how, how did you go from just like a middle schooler to someone who started a whole nonprofit organization, not in terms of your actions, but rather the skills that you've developed? Um, the number one skill I would recommend for everyone is honestly just networking. I probably send 20 to 50 emails a week to people I don't know. I always send emails to people. I DM people. Um, I DM'd people who I never thought in a million years would respond to me with millions of followers who did respond to me. Um, and so just put yourself out there. If there's a climate organization you want to get involved with, email them. Um, the worst they can do is not respond, but um, in the best case scenario and the most likely scenario is that they will respond and that they will be very gracious for you for offering your time and your expertise to help them. Um, and always just emphasize how you can add value to different organizations and what makes you different. Cool, thank you so much. Okay, the next question is from Valeria from Costa Rica. Can you just turn on your camera and also the microphone? Thank you. see me? Uh, well, I have two um, important questions. And the first one is like, what do you think is like a key element to combat uh, the climate change and all the environmental problems we're having right now? I just unmuted myself, sorry. Um, so one of the key things that I think is really important to acknowledge is that um, this might be a bit pessimistic, but there's not that much that one person, like one person's actions will have on the climate crisis. The most important thing people really can do is to vote um, because at the end of the day, the climate crisis is caused by these systematic issues. Um, and so if we don't get our government to act, and because I think the statistic is something like, 70% um, of all of our emissions are because of only 100 companies. So if we're not regulating those companies and getting them to decrease their emissions and to really change their practices, um, then we really won't be able to have the large systematic widespread change that we need. Um, and so really, if you can get involved with local, um, with local politicians' campaigns, if you can really advocate, advocate for climate-friendly candidates, get your parents to vote for climate-friendly candidates. Like, I know I just turned 18, so I can finally vote, like, woohoo. But if you can't vote, um, then definitely you can help to lobby for politicians, and you can encourage your, um, your parents to vote for climate-friendly candidates, because I really do think one of the biggest components of this is voting. Uh, thank you so much. And I have another question. It's that uh, in my community, we don't have like an organization or really like in my country. So I really like want to start something in my school or in my local, you know, in my community. So do you have any tips for that? Um, so first, you need to figure out like the legal process in your country for setting up a nonprofit so that you can be legally registered because that will like give you tax deductible um, status. A lot of like different things that really make you legitimate. 
Um, and secondly, um, a lot of different climate organizations offer the option to start chapters in your area. And so I would encourage you to look into that rather than just starting your own climate organization, because if you start a chapter of an organization, they can give you a lot of resources. Like they can give you a toolkit, they can give you access to press contacts, a lot of different very helpful things um, that will make it a lot easier. And also they can like fiscally sponsor you and give you the status that you want so you can have all these nice perks. Um, and so that is a lot easier than just starting your own climate organization, especially if you're just first starting off. But if it's more like a community organization, then honestly just go for it and just like organize different community, um, organ uh, different community events for people to participate in. Thank you so much. So, okay, we have, Next question from Anita from UK. Can you just turn on your microphone and your camera? Okay, seeing that she is not there. So I'm going from to, net, to the next participant that is Joshua from Ghana. Joshua from Ghana, are you there? Okay, seeing she is also not written. So we have next delegate, um, uh, Anura from Qatar. Um, hello. Uh, you have said yeah. that uh, your uh, climate organization has started digital strikes. So I wanted to know whether uh, how useful these digital strikes are in communities where people are usually afraid of protesting due to the police or the government. Um, the digital strike is just a great opportunity for people to get involved in the climate movement. Like it's very easy. Um, and really like it's just a great um, way for us to continue climate advocacy during COVID because a lot of stuff has been um, really halted. A lot of strikes a lot of events have been canceled um and so if you're just posting on like your social medias about how you're joining the climate strike then it just shows people that the climate crisis is still happening and it's something important for people to pay attention to so it's just good for raising awareness especially during this like particular time okay thank you so the next question is from scarlet from bolivia can you just turn on your microphone and your camera Okay, seeing she is not there. So we are going moving to the next. Is that is Zane from Egypt? Oh hi. Uh, first off, I wanted to say thank you for your presentation. It was really great and informative and it really taught me a lot of things. And I just had a question of um, do you have a specific age range age range for people who volunteer? So like do you not accept anyone under a specific age? We don't really have an age range. Um, it just so has happened. Like, obviously, we have students who want to volunteer with us because we're giving out community service hours. Like, that is our incentive. So, like, pretty much any student of, like, any age with, within, like, reason. I think if you're, like, five years old, I'm not sure if you can translate to the um, quality that we want. If you are fluent in a language, then we would love for you to help us translate. Um, and then if you are not bilingual, then the way that you can help is with one of our teams. But to help with one of our teams, obviously you need to have like a little bit of experience in whatever you're applying for, like marketing, social media, international relations, because like we do have an application, you have to like put down your information, your resume, whatever. Um, and so we don't have an age range per se, but it is a little self-selective. Okay, great. Thank you. And I'm just going to also add, I know everyone's asking, like, how do you join Climate Cardinals? How can you um, apply? So I dropped the link in the chat so you can see that uh, www.climatecardinals.org slash join our team or just climatecardinals.org in general. And then on our Instagram, which I forgot to link, but I can also link. We usually um, have reminders about when we reopen applications for different things. Uh, we will probably be closing our team application because it's been filling up really fast in like one or two weeks. Um, but we do periodically open it. So you can usually check our Instagram to see any job openings. And then on my personal Instagram, Sophia Kiani, you can also see that same information. Um, and then also information about the other climate organizations that I'm involved in. 
Okay, so the next question is from Rika Funk from Philippines. Rika? So, you know, turn on your camera. Uh, how, how effective, don't look at me. How effective is our individual lifestyle changes compared to wide scale policy changes made by big corporations in combating climate change? Um, well, it is never ineffective to act on a like small local basis. Like that's never something I would say. Like every single action is important and every single action matters. Um, just because when you're raising awareness, especially like on a smaller scale in your community, you know, you never know who could be in a position of power. So when you are educating like everyone around you, if that person is ever, you know, like in a position of power in a company, they can implement more sustainable practices if they end up becoming a politician. Um, then they can advocate for climate legislation. So it's always very effective to organize on a small grassroots level. Um, but obviously, uh, it is very, very important to get uh, legislation passed because that's the way that we have widespread, like, systematic change that has to be enforced um, through regulations. Okay, moving to next. Uh, Umayama from Press. Um, really nice presentation. Thank you very much. Um, I learned a lot. Um, I have a question. So what is the hardest thing in your opinion of running an environmental organization and how have you tried to overcome the hardest thing in your opinion? Um, <laughs> there's so much, but so I, I guess to begin, one of the hardest things was when I first launched Climate Cardinals, I had no idea that it was going to be this big. I really only expected 100 people to sign up, but we had a launch video that reached over 300,000 people. And so in the first day, we had over a thousand people sign up and I was super overwhelmed because I didn't have a team. It was just me and two of my friends. Um, and so I was kind of scared. I didn't know really how to move forward. And so another component of it was like finding the time to do all of this. Um, and so really what I realized is that it's so important to really um, has, have as many people as possible to help you. I never want to be like a power hoarder or I need to realize like I can't just micromanage every single part of my organization. I really have given my team members and my directors the autonomy that they need to function. Um, and even though that was a little hard for me in the beginning, it's really paid off because we've been able to do so much more now because now we have like directors who are overseeing the parts of the organization that I used to oversee. And even though it's been a little difficult for me to like give up part of my baby, like it's also really, really nice to realize that I don't have to spend like 24 7 managing like all of our social medias or all of our campaigns right thank you very much of course thank you so we have mario from mexico thanks my question would be what did encourage you to join in this kind of activities and how you can share that kind of encouragement to have kids and teenagers to came up to the cause? Um, so like I said, really the encouragement for me was um, I really wanted to educate my relatives. I was able to educate my relatives and seeing them learn about the climate crisis and really understand how important it was, was all the encouragement that I needed to realize that I was really having an impact. Thank you. So we have last, that is Joshua from Ghana. Oh. Uh, um, I wanted to know how, for example, how I handle a situation where we have skilled people, but we don't know that skill, that skill can be used to tackle climate change, but we don't know how to use it to our advantage. How do I handle a situation like that? That's a really, really great question. Um, and so what I really would say is that I think that it's really uh, important for people to realize how intersectional the climate crisis is. It really intersects with like so many different sectors of our economy, so many different jobs. Um, and so even if you're not intending on majoring in environmental science, for example, if you're majoring in business, you can, uh, you can undergo like sustainable ventures, you can uh, like you can 
um, be, really be investing your money in sustainable businesses. Uh, if you're like in music, you can, you can try to donate part of your proceeds to a climate change organization. There's just so many different ways people can use their skills. So even if you're not specifically in a climate change field, you can make it a climate change field. Okay. Thank you very much. So now we have completed with the question and answers session. Yep. All right. Um, I think that has um, the time for this session has expired. Uh, Ms. Kiani, you are an inspiration to um, not just our students here, but young people and grown-ups around the world. And um, we all commend your work. And, and I think I can say on behalf of the students who are here today, um, they all benefited greatly from, from having you speak to them. Thank you so much for joining. Of course, thank you so much for having me. I hope this inspired people. I would love to see you guys join Climate Cardinals. Definitely hit me up if you guys have any questions. Um, and yeah, thank you for listening. Will do, thank you so much. All right, everybody, thank you so much. I'm gonna shut the meeting down. Have a good day. Bye, thank you.